Good morning. morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Not long ago, I was speaking with someone, and this person was deeply troubled about the idea of hell. They just couldn't reconcile that a loving God would send a good person to hell. I did my best to answer his questions, but After our conversation, it dawned on me, his problem was he viewed people as essentially being good, and he didn't understand the true nature of God. We all know people who fall into this category and may very well have had similar conversations. Too often the world looks at the Christian God as if he's looking down, watching, And if someone does the slightest small thing wrong, that person goes to hell for eternity. A lot of people think the Christian view of God means he's just a cruel and mean God. The worldview is there really are a few people that are bad, like Hitler out there. But the rest of us are essentially good. So it seems like total overkill to send somebody to hell. (laughs) Although it might surprise you, I agree with him. In the sense that it would be total overkill for God to be sending a good person to hell. It's important for us in evangelism, for our own assurance, to make sure that we're grounded in the foundational understanding about who God is, who we are, and why the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important. And so this morning, I hope to dive into these things, drive some clarity, and I think we should begin with understanding that God's holiness demands separation. Throughout the scripture is an ever-present theme of God's holiness. The words in scripture for holiness define it as a uniqueness, something that is separate and set apart for a purpose. The core idea behind holiness is absolute purity. God is not only perfectly good, he is the very source and standard of goodness. The prophet Isaiah declared, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's the only description of God repeated in threefold formula. It's a literary device to bring great emphasis God is not just a little bit holy. God is really, really, really holy. God's holiness is his defining characteristic. It's a term used in the Bible to describe both his goodness and his power. He's completely unique, utterly all-powerful. Holiness radiates from God like an energy. I heard a metaphor that compared God's holiness to the sun. If you think about it, the sun is unique, at least in our solar system, and it's really powerful. And it's the source of all this beautiful life on Earth. So you can think of the sun as holy. It's set apart for a specific purpose. And you can actually take this metaphor a little further and say the whole area around the sun is holy. Because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. That very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. In the same way, there's this paradox at the core and center of God's own holiness. Because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. The first time we see this paradox is in the story of Moses in the burning bush. God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, don't come any closer. It's intense. God is physically representing to us how unique, pure, and set apart he is. There's nothing impure about him, and he can't, by nature, have a part of impurity. Habakkuk wrote in chapter 1, verse 13, Habakkuk said, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. 
And that's the thing. God's holiness and pureness can't fully be described. Even as I'm speaking, I'm not sure I'm able to fully articulate the holiness of God. We can understand it through the writings of the prophets and the apostles, but we won't fully grasp it until we experience it. God is pure. God is holy. God cannot sin because sin is defined in relationship to who God is and what he does. Anything God does cannot be sin simply because God did it. Sin is a failure to live up to God's standards, which comes to us. If God is totally pure, which can have no part in corruption and impurity, then human unrighteousness demands sanctification. Like I said before, it would be total overkill for God to be sending a good person to hell. The problem is, the Bible has a very different view of human nature. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says that no one is righteous, no one is good, all have turned away from God. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus said, it is the heart that's fallen, it is the heart that is corrupt. God doesn't send good people to hell because no one is good. History also supports this theological claim. A well-known religious philosopher named G.K. Chesterton once said, original sin, i.e. the brokenness of mankind, is the one doctrine that can be proven outside of the Bible. And I think he's right. All we have to do is look at the history of mankind, and it's clear that something is desperately broken with human beings. Dr. Clay Jones is a Christian scholar who studied human evil and suffering as much as anybody who's alive. And Dr. Jones decided to study evil in depth in the 20th century, and he began with the assumption that evil is done by just a few deranged individuals. But what he found stunned him. What he found was it wasn't just the Pol Pots and the Hitlers that contributed to evil, but masses of human beings under the right circumstances and the right times did and practiced great acts of evil. What he found was that human beings are deeply wicked. Let's look at just a few examples from the 20th century. Take the Chinese government, for example responsible for at least the deaths of 25 to 30 million people. Take the Russians, responsible for starving out at least 6 million Ukrainians. And the Japanese government brutalized at least 300,000 Chinese in what's called the Rape of Nanjing, in a way that even Nazis looking on were horrified. Let's face it, an American culture supporting tens of millions of abortions. The point is that mass evil is not done by individuals. But what Dr. Jones found, I think, is right. Human beings are desperately corrupt and deeply fallen. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul wrote, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. God doesn't send good people to hell because nobody is truly good. When evil things happen, we often hear people describe it as inhumane. A Christian author named Josh McDowell once said, don't describe acts like that as inhumane because inhumane means not human. He says, it's humans who do that. And he's right. Whether we turn on the daily news or we look throughout the history of the world, it's human beings who have done and continue to do evil things. The Bible doesn't define sin as great acts of evil. It defines sin throughout Scripture as anything that is contrary to the very nature and goodness of God. And we were originally created and designed to be that way. Think about the seven abominations in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. It reads, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Proud eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, 
a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. I hope nobody in here has shed innocent blood, but we have all certainly lied. We've all certainly acted pridefully. The fall has brought corruption into this world because we've turned away from how we were designed to be. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 22 and 23, he says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the, been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So if we understand the creator of all things is so holy and pure, he can have no part of unrighteousness, no part of sin or corruption. And we as humans, all of us, have in some way, great or small, acted in an unholy way, then I contend that salvation demands choice. So you might be thinking, okay, so nobody's truly good, but why would God send anybody to hell? Part of the answer to that is that God doesn't send people to hell. If C.S. Lewis was right in his classic book, The Great Divorce, God doesn't send people to hell, People choose it. In fact, towards the end of that book, he famously says this, There are two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, Thy will be done. All who are in hell, choose it. I know someone who is clinging to a particular sin in their life, and I'll never forget when he once told me that he would never stop acting and practicing this sin, even if it meant that God would condemn to hell for eternity. There's also a well-known atheist who died recently, and he passed around the news for everyone shortly before his death, and he said, if any story comes out after I die that I converted on my bedside, that story is false. I will not believe in God. Friends, human autonomy is strong. God has given us free will, and we're stubborn. Many of us don't want to believe in God and all that it entails to follow after him. But you know what? God respects people's choices. If people choose not to believe in God, God is not going to force them to believe in him. Please realize the existence of hell brings no pleasure to God. The medieval depictions of people being tortured mercilessly and endlessly and somehow God reveling in it with pleasure are false. Hell is a terrible place. We've been designed to be in a relationship with God and a relationship with other people. And in hell, all of that is lost. In Ezekiel verses, or chapter 18, verse 23, God asks this. God says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Would I not rather that they turn from their wicked ways and live? You might be wondering, why can't God just forgive? If God can do anything, can he just announce that we're forgiven? Yes, God can do anything, but he can't do anything inconsistent with his moral nature. God is the holy, righteous judge of the universe. Therefore, he can't be indifferent to sin. But what God has done is even better. You see, he's offered the death of his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life as an act of love towards us, but also as an act of justice. So the question is, are we willing to accept the free gift of salvation, the free offer of forgiveness God has to offer to each of us? Many Christians who turn atheists, who left the faith, if you probe their theology, it makes you wonder if they ever understood the gospel in the first place. When you get deep and ask what the gospel is and who Jesus is, you find they may not have truly understood the heart of the gospel, truly understood who God has proclaimed to be. I was at a Bible study one time, and the group I was with was discussing why God put so many restrictions on life. Why, in their words, Scripture was so full of don'ts. 
don't do this. You can't do that. I finally chimed in and I said, God isn't restricting life. He's not giving rules to restrict our fun. You have to put yourself in God's perspective. God can see the end of the road. And he knows if you go down that path, there's destruction. But if you go to the right, there's life. Let's face it. Hell is a troubling thought. I don't like the idea of hell. The thought that some of my friends or family and loved ones, or really anyone, could end up in hell is a disturbing thought. When it's all said and done, though, to me, there's one compelling reason to believe that hell is real. Jesus taught about the reality of hell. Jesus had the most authority and clarity of vision of anybody who's ever lived. And as a sinless son of God who performed miracles and rose from the grave, Jesus had the authority to teach about hell. If Jesus was willing to talk about it and warn people lovingly about the possibility of hell, how could we do differently? So we have to make the choice. We have to choose to follow Jesus and enter into salvation through baptism. And we also have to choose to daily make the choice to walk in Jesus Christ, to continue to struggle in repentance, to glorify God, live in holiness, and live the life he designed for us. And so this morning, I leave you with those things, and I offer you the choice to make. If you have one to make, I invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.